Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. If you've ever read the Grimm Brothers fairy tales, the actual German versions, and not the ones that the Walt Disney World would want to show you, but you know that they're pretty grim. I remember reading Cinderella in my German class when I was a teenager and getting shocked at the stepsisters chopping off their heels and toes and the birds pecking out their eyes so that they could fit into that glass slipper. The reason the Grimm brothers wrote pretty grim tales was to teach children that outside of the bubble of their hopefully protective home, the world is full of bad actors. The events of yesterday afternoon with the shooting at the Trump rally in Pennsylvania confirms that we still live in a world with violence. And the reading from Mark's Gospel also shows us that dangers are still surrounding us in the world. Now I'm guessing that when you came here this morning, you were not expecting to hear such a gruesome lesson in the Gospel. We're used to stories where Jesus is doing some sort of teaching or healing or calming the chaos that's around him. In fact, we're actually used to Jesus being the central character of the Gospel. But Jesus isn't present here. He's not part of this scene at all. And that's just one of the many hallmarks of this particular Gospel lesson and why Mark has put this really perverse birthday party scene in the middle of his telling of the life of Jesus. When Jesus isn't around, men and women will do corrupt and horrible things. And to get a full appreciation of this, I'm going to remind us of where we left off last week, since these readings are actually going in order. Last week, Jesus, after having suffered rejection in his own hometown, was sending out the disciples in pairs to do the work of healing and driving out demons and so forth. He advised the twelve to travel lightly and not take any baggage with them. Go to the people and places. If they welcome you, stay. These are the homes that would trust the disciples, these itinerant strangers, and receive them and their message of love and mercy. If a place rejected them, move on. No point in wasting time with those who aren't is interested in hearing about the love of God. Sending them in pairs was important. Not only could this ensure that there was the necessary witness to whatever great acts they were able to do, it also meant that there was a buddy system in place because things were not necessarily safe for those who dared to teach a message of good news for the poor, release for the captives, sight for the blind, and freedom for the oppressed. To further illustrate what type of world surrounded Jesus and his disciples, Mark gives us this story of John's death to show us what happened to the one who was preaching at the start of the gospel a message of prepare the way and get right with God. This story we heard is a flashback. I'm sorry that we didn't have the sound effects for you for the gospel, you know, blah, 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 blah. but that's what's going on. This is, a, this is a flashback. Herod Antipas has been hearing about Jesus and is afraid that this is the ghost of John the baptizer coming back to haunt him. 
Who is Herod Antipas? Let's start with the fact that he's not really a king, as Mark has said, but he is one of the sons of this king Herod family and is a tetrarch, meaning he rules a fourth of the kingdom. Think of it as like the mayor of a really, really large region. The Herods, the whole lot of them, were not good Jews. As Chet Myers notes, they followed Torah only when it was politically convenient to do so. They were Roman puppet rulers, which is made clear with this illegal marriage of Herod to his niece and sister-in-law, Herodias. Herod dumped his first wife, who was an Arabian princess, and Herodias left Herod's brother, Philip, who was both her husband and uncle, to marry Herod. Did you catch that Herod's new bride is his niece and sister-in-law, and that Herodias had been married to her other uncle? This is how messed up this family is, and we have not even gotten to those antics of the birthday party yet. John the Baptizer, a guy who was not afraid to call out the authorities, has raised a ruckus about this marriage. For Herod, this is a problem. He's already committed a political faux pas by dismissing his first wife, who runs back to her father, the king of Nabataea, and neighboring territory. He knows that John has been gaining followers out of the out at the Jordan, and now he fears that he's going to have the Nabataeans joining with John's crowd in a possible insurrection to avenge this hasty divorce. Herod arrests John. Maybe he thought that would shut him up. Maybe this would appease Herodias, who also hates John. Herod decides to throw a birthday banquet. Some of the most powerful and prestigious muckety-mucks of Galilee have come together to party-hardy with Herod. Reclining at table with him are the political, military, and governmental elites of this area of Roman control. Herod's stepdaughter performs a dance that enthralls Herod and his guests. Some commentators suggest that this girl, probably about 12 years old, dances in a seductive way. This should start to make your skin crawl. A drunken Herod makes a wild promise to her, one which Mark's audience would hear as having echoes of their heroine, Queen Esther. Half my kingdom for whatever you ask. But this little girl is no Queen Esther. This girl runs to her mama for counsel. Her mother demands the death of a beloved prophet sitting in a dungeon. Now, one might start to feel sorry for this child. On the one hand, this girl has a lecherous, incestuous stepdad, and on the other hand, she has this bloodthirsty, vengeful, incestuous mother. But this little girl is no little darling either. Not only does she do her mama's bidding, she adds her own depraved twist. She wants the head of John the Baptist at once on a platter. How low can these royals go? The guard is sent off. The execution happens. The platter gets passed around like another course at this very disturbing banquet. Power, when absent from any moral checkpoints, becomes a really bloody mess. That's the purpose of Mark telling us this story. 
Remember, Jesus is not anywhere near this scene. This is a case where the holy is wholly absent. When love is not tempering the inclination of the human heart to seek its own self-satisfaction, power becomes corrupt, evil, and destructive. A good lesson for us to keep in mind here in the 21st century. It's also a reminder that those disciples sent out two by two into the surrounding villages were not entering places that were necessarily safe because the ruling empire was not safe. Standing up for love and bringing health, healing, and hope to people will face opposition, and sometimes even violent opposition from the bullies and tyrants of the world. And yet, Jesus still says, go. Go armed with love, not weapons. Go without coercion. Go and speak of God's grace and mercy. Jesus is still saying to us, go. Go and hold fast to that truth of love. Now, we didn't hear it this morning, but in some of the verses following this very horrific scene with Herod and his gang, Jesus introduces a different feast, a more amazing banquet. With just two fishes and five loaves of bread, he'll feed 5,000 people hungry for something good to eat. Out of so little comes such an abundance, a marked contrast to the vile excesses of Herod's party. This Jesus feast is full of compassion, mercy, and the power of love. That's the party we're invited to. That is the food and drink offered to our souls, weary and worn out, by the pressures of a world gone mad with guns and hate speech. We're brought to this table to be reminded of our citizenship in Christ and a love feast that gives us the freedom to build up people for the work of liberating those who are suffering in our community. May our hearts be ready to accept and receive this food and feast upon it richly. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.